Hi, my name is Jamie Tomey, and I am pleased to welcome you to this week's Evanston Bound Artist Talk and Quarren Tour, featuring our friend, papermaker and artist, Lucy Baxendahl from England. This is brought to you by Artist Bookhouse, and I hope you enjoy today's session. Thank you for joining us for this week's Quarantine Tour with Lucy Baxendahl. Lucy, how are you doing? Hi. Good. Thank so you. So, what for time is it there? You? I'm okay. What time is it there? It's 6 p.m. Have you had some dinner? Not yet. I will okay. do that later. But okay. I have fed the dog, which is the main thing. The dog needed to be fed first. The dog needed her tea, yeah. So we're good. We're good with that. And so where are you right now, both in your studio? Where's your studio located? And where in the country are you out? Are you outside of London? How far are you from London? Just put us in a place on the map so that we can, we can sort of picture it. Sure thing. Well, I'm sitting in my shop stroke studio at the moment. And I'm in the front section, which is the, the shop section. And it has what you can see behind me sort of receding into the distance is my workspace. And it's also a teaching space. Um, and it is next door to my house, which is really cool because it means I can work in lockdown. Where I am is in a town by the name of Berwick-upon-Tweed. Mm. And it is spelt Berwick, so B-R-W-I-C-K. And it is, if you imagine the Great Britain as Chicago, then I'm in the section which would be just what, where Rogers Park turns into Evanston. Oh, okay. So, so you're up here by me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> two miles south of the Scottish border. Mm in the north very northeastern corner of england so the scottish border runs at about i don't know which way you're seeing this but uh, it runs from northeast to southwest okay at about 45 degrees and we're up in the right up in the tippy toppy tippy toppy i love it thank you for putting us in a specific place or sort of being able to look that up and envision where you actually are. Because you yeah. are by far, so far, our farthest Evanston bound quarantine. So Yay. thank you for joining us. <laughs> I'm so, probably closer than, than New Mexico though, if you're gonna talk to Meredith and um, I know, I know. She's on the list. She's right. on the list. So yes, yeah, she probably are. Although she's not six hours difference. So there's that. But no, the time um, no, but this and so, yeah, but distance wise. So uh, one of the questions that we usually start with for our quarantine tours is how did you come to the book arts? What brought you to this work um, in your schooling and in your life? Well, I started off, my first degree was in um, languages, in French and German. And I had a, quite a sort of checkered resume going from from journalism to language teaching and, and so on, but I always needed to be making, um, whether it was jewelry or, or um, painting or, or whatever, although I didn't at that point have any formal training in it. And then when we were in Chicago, um, we came to Chicago, we'd lived in Ireland for a long time and I'd, I'd been running a little jewellery business in Ireland, in Northern Ireland. And then we came to Chicago for my husband's work because he, was, he got a post at the UFC teaching music. And the kids were quite young at that stage and I was continuing on, I was teaching part-time, partly nursery school, partly substitute teaching at uh, middle and high school and we were living down in Hyde Park and um, I just started I th I'd always because I studied a lot of literature as part of my language courses I'd always been fascinated by books as objects and I'd kind of started making little one-off artist books 
very sort of personal ones and I just couldn't find the papers that I wanted to use. So I got an Arnold Grummer kit and just start, started making paper in the kitchen, in the apartment. And really I just kind of got hooked from there. And I took a, I took a class with a lady named Mary Tepper at the old Hyde Park Arts Centre where it was before it moved to its lovely new building. Yeah, I had a meeting. I had a meeting with Mary this morning. Oh, I saw her you. this morning. Yeah, oh, right. I didn't meet her in person, of course. It was it was on on the Zoom. But I I saw her this morning. I wish I would have known that you that was your first experience. I would have said something to her. Yeah, well, that was my first class that I went to, and that was making paper one week and then binding it into a wee single section book the following week. And from there, I just started, I had a lot of friends who worked in um, special collections at the Regenstein Library, the UFC Library. And I was just sort of talking about books and a friend said, well, do you know that there is this course or this, this center at Columbia College that specializes in these things? And then I found out about the MFA and I was like, oh, that's amazing. And, and one thing that was so great about it was that it wasn't exclusively for people who'd taken a fine arts or a, an arts practice degree for bachelors, because often master's programs won't let you in if you don't have a very directly relevant degree. And because of this, it said it was open to educators. Um, that meant that that I had a, a chance of getting in. But what I did, <laughs> I was so untechy in those days. And myself and um, Marlene Russell Scott, I don't know if you remember Marlene, we were kind of the uh, the class mummers, if you like. We were we were very much um, more mature than the rest of the students. Sure. So, and uh, in my case, a bit less techy. So I actually bought my portfolio to. The admissions office, sort of physically in a big box. Nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Instead of it, which caused some amusement, to put it mildly. So I just thought, oh god, I've blown it, I've blown it. There's no yeah. way. <laughs> um, but then, you know, the rest is history, as you say. So yeah, that, that's it. Really, was just through making and trying to bring. The making side of things and the books side of things yeah, together. Yeah. So, um, what was the what was the the because of course with with the book arts we have a lot of different disciplines. There's writing, storytelling, um, the actual structure of the book as a Nothing. codex, paper making, sculptural paper making, mm -hmm. book artists who who expand the idea of the book. So yeah. what was it about paper making specifically that just was the thing that became your passion that now is your career, really? Yeah, it's, it was interesting because obviously there were so many opportunities on that course. And I think I was somewhat influenced by, I just kind of took the process, I think, it was really interesting to see how different people gravitated towards mm -hmm. aspects of the disciplines that suited their personalities. Okay. So that there were people who were very meticulous, very patient, didn't particularly like getting mucky, <laughs> you know, and have ended up as conservators and, and bookbinders right. and you know, the sort of, petrol heads as we call them over here who like fiddling with machines who kind of got more into the letterpress. I'm still a, a little scared of Vandercooks to this day. <laughs> like, I was thinking of like a big motorbike, you know. Um, but I, I think I've always also been interested in plants. Oh, okay. And identifying wildflowers and, and that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, hanging out with people like Cecile and, and just sort of yeah. seeing what was people, what was some, um, what was possible with using plant fibers. Yeah. The field of paper making was, was very appealing to me as well. Yeah. 
So those of us who are in our audience who don't know who she just mentioned, Cecile, Cecile Webster is a, a, a Chicago institution. She's, she, she is a paper maker and she has explored paper making from different plants and has back in the old, in the center, we used to have this huge wall of all of her papers that she made from all of these different plants. And so yeah. that's, that's really great that you mentioned her because she's, she's a, she's a legend and she inspired you. That sounds like. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 And, um, and there's, you know, actually, I, I want to mention also, there's a comment in the chat defending Vandercooks that says I, Vandercooks are 100% friendly. I, I, Honestly, I have nothing against them. I'm just slightly scared. It's <laughs> just <laughs> not your bag. <laughs> You're the paper. No, I, do. Right. I, I do want to get back into it. Actually, I have just got a teeny tiny little um, Adana. Oh, okay. um, now, do you at your shop, um, let's transition a little bit. I, yeah. I still want to talk about how you came and because I'm really fascinated by the story of your um, path, I guess, in the in the bio that you sent me that we Put in the in the email and in the thing so but I want to mention your shop too mm -hmm. in the normal times you actually sell things and yeah. paper and you you're doing things so yeah. so how did that process so when did you when did you leave Chicago and I left, how, did, left how did this work Chicago in um, 2007 okay. okay and um, we'd had a slightly odd situation where the day after our graduation in 2005 there was a fire in the next door building to us. We lived in Washington Park at that point. Um, there was a fire in the next door building that spread to our building and mm -hmm. our condo got burned. Oh my gosh, so, I think I remember this happening. Remember that? I I remember. And then we were displaced pretty much for a year. And during that year, we kind of made the decision for various reasons, I won't bore you with, to come back. Uh, mostly family reasons but during that year what was great was I had a studio in um, Bridgeport and and I took it over from Joel Beeman when he moved to Florida yeah. and he was sharing a studio in an old factory building and I took over his share of that studio which was amazing and it was during that time that I had the show at Vespine. Oh yeah! <laughs> I that, do. Was, that was work that came from the fire. From the fire. Was, I remember yeah. that too. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, it seems like another age. But um, so what, ha what happened then was we came back and I had a studio. Then we lived in Oxford for five years. Um, again, for Martin's work. And I had a studio there and then we moved to London for six years and then I had a studio there but what was happening was I was doing I was making a lot of paper but I was also making a lot of artwork and you get in the situation where you know you have open studios maybe once or twice a year and you can sell online and I was exhibiting in shows but I thought what I really wanted to do was to make it more open and sort of raise awareness of paper arts because over here even though paper making went from east to west and the skills for kind of western style paper making obviously came to the US via here via Europe we didn't have this we didn't have Dard Hunter to help us kind of yeah, spread the, get the interest going again um, and I guess I just I was always I was working with schools I was doing a lot of community stuff and still do when the schools are open um, and I I guess I just wanted to be out there yeah and easily accessible in a way that if you're in a kind of studio collective, which all these places were, and they were absolutely brilliant. I, I absolutely loved being in those, those situations. But family situation that my mum needed um, a bit of help. 
kind of it wasn't really working in London mm -hmm. and although we were all in London something had to change and then this place came up and it, I was I was kind of mooching around on a on a property site as you do when you're dreaming sure and I found this place and it had been on the market for a long while and it was like it was in my favorite street in my favorite town yeah Eric um, we still have a lot of friends up here have very strong emotional ties to the place and even though the timing was atrocious I just thought hell I'm gonna have a look at it yeah and so I came up and then I thought oh god this is I mean it's a fully fitted shop and the, the lady who we bought it from actually still has the shop next door oh, okay so um we're still neighbors and it was just it was almost too good to be true mm -hmm. and i thought i really can't do this now this is crazy and if i do i'll have to persuade my mother to come with me so long story short we begged and borrowed and stole and built this financial house of cards <laughs> which could still collapse, still I mean. collapse but you know. um, and, here, and here we are so yeah. it's it's worked out really really well um and although obviously at the moment things are very challenging as they are for everybody um you know the general principle of welcoming people in off the street it's still um, Using people to the paper art seems to be going yeah. down very well. And you have a lot of people during normal times come by. Just is this mm -hmm. a street that you have a lot of foot traffic on? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you have people street. come in. Yeah, it's a street full of independent businesses. This is we're right on the coast, so there's there's very strong tourist traffic in the summer when when normal normal happen. times, right? Um, <laughs> So yeah, and also there's there's a, a very healthy local bookbinding scene. There's a guy who lives about 20 miles from here who's a very well-known bookbinder and teaches. So I have quite a lot of his students. Yeah, nice. And order do custom orders from me um, for particular projects that they're doing. Also, yeah. we have a lot of printmakers here. Yeah. So you have and you teach classes there in the back of your space. Yep. some workshops during normal times of course during yep. normal Workshop. times and then i'm back and forth to london and um west sussex which is even further south than london yeah to, uh, to teach down there too yeah but right now of course we're all you're still on lockdown are you guys opening up at all um right now or are you still on phase one we are where we are with with non-essential retail is is we're supposed to be able to open from the 15th okay. but we've got to comply with all sorts of safety measures and um i think probably what i'm going to do for at least the first couple of weeks is just to open by appointment mm -hmm. yeah. um, i have to keep my mother safe and she's actually sort of on the premises so yeah. And she's in her 90s. So she's 94. Yeah, she's yeah. very healthy for 94. But obviously, I need to, I need to be careful. And I'm, I'm kind of rearranging things so that I can manage with social distancing. And we'll, we'll see how we go. But everybody's in the same position. Of course. You know? Of course. The really sad thing is that normally in spring, one thing that I do a lot is I work with... Um, particularly master's students, postgraduate students, who are doing projects for their degree shows, which involve paper making in one form or another, and they need a bit of help with it. And of course, this year- You haven't been able to- That's that. happened, and that's a shame, because I really enjoy doing that, but- Yeah. I'm sure in future years, it will come back again, I hope. It'll come back again. Yeah. So what are you, what have you been working on during the, the pandemic? Do you have sort of a, um, a, um, okay, so I'm sorry to interrupt myself. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca has said it, master's equals postgraduate is graduate in American English because why not? So because, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yes. It's, that's yeah, it's like yeah. Um, um, an MA. 
basically. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Thank sort of you for clarifying. Sorry. Right. So <laughs> for those of us who don't speak English, English. We are divided by a common language, as they say. Right. So, but um, I was just thinking, like, you are able to go to your studio this whole time mm -hmm. because it's yep. right there. What yep. have you been working on? And is there any way, this is kind of a double question, and I always forget that I should separate the two, but how has your practice as an artist changed? Besides the fact that you're not helping other people, how has your own practice as an artist changed since the pandemic started? I think it's an interesting question. I think it has allowed me to go back and revisit some aspects of my work that were kind of almost unfinished business. And it, you know, sometimes you do things and you say, right, okay, finish up, been there, done that, onto the next thing. Sure. But actually, you find yourself drawn back. And I think that's what's happened with me, um, particularly as a lot of my work is around the themes of geology, layering, sedimentation, layering of memory, mm. um, encapsulating of, of things in a particular moment, um, sort of similar to fossilization, if you like. And I suppose I've, I've allowed myself to go back to that more. And this area, this place that I'm in, is where the inspiration for all that originally came from. So those oh, rocks yeah. are here. Um, they're on the beaches where I walk my dog. Right. So I, it's, it's kind of given me this space. I mean, basically, I've been frantically making stock for when the shop reopens as well. Of so I'm kind of making envelopes and and writing paper and all that kind of thing um the greetings cards because you have to pay the bills right right um and but i've also been doing a lot more of i've been i've been working with um sort of blooper sheets of paper i think this is mitsumata and ones which have got big air bubbles in yeah I'm using the air bubbles as structural elements like there's a big bubble and a bubble there and I've used those as starting points for for these craters. Um, and is that pencil on there or ink? That's ink. That's that's yeah. a so you one. called it what? A blooper paper? A blooper paper because oh, I it's, love that it's term. not a sheet that I could it's not a sheet that I could you know yeah. put on the shelf as yeah. a piece of paper. I love um, that term. That is a fantastic way to say this mistake can be something beautiful. I love it. Well, I mean, I've really, it's the sort of thing that normally I wouldn't have time to do. Yeah. Um, but I guess because, let's see, I've got another one of those somewhere. Yeah, I've done a few of these. So um, there's another one which had a big sort of. Oh my of goodness. Area is that also middle. ink? Because that looks pen. Yeah, that's yeah, really beautiful. So yeah. when you mentioned the the area that you're in, this is where you came a lot when you were a child too. So yes. those layers of memories are there. Yes. So the very much. are so. not just the geology, but also the memory. Absolutely. Uh -huh. I love that. Absolutely, and that's that's very much been a a, a kind of constant in my work if you like from from when i started doing this um yeah. and i've also a kind of extension of that is that i've been working with plastic that washes up on the beach we have a lot of um, plastic pollution here so i'm using i work a lot with abaca yeah is um, this overbeaten or is this because it this looks is very overbeaten. thin yeah. yeah it's overbeaten and it's got plastic items from the beach oh, and wow. seaweed from the beach encapsulated in there and I'm working with that in different ways so at the moment some of them are just like so we have I'm trying to make sure you oh can my see gosh that. there's an airplane and a heart and, and a lego heart, yeah so there's all kinds of ways of working with this and some of them are just wow. I'm, I'm kind of appreciating them in themselves, but I'm also 
working in the same way with a bit with text. Oh my gosh. Wait, and the text is... I don't even know what... Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I is that... Wish. Well, that's backwards, actually. <laughs> that's, backwards. that's backwards. There's the... So is this... Is this... Um, what kind of text is this? Is this paper or plastic? Wood. Wood? Wooden laser cut letters, oh, yeah. I just God. found them in my local craft store. Wow. And I thought, oh, that's fun. Yeah, that is fun. But, you know, there's there's so much messing around that you can do, really, and um, experimenting, and this is experimenting. There's another one of the beach ones. But but yeah, and you're keeping them spoon. Um, monochromatic, which is interesting as well. Yeah, so I'm wanting to um, add as well, and one thing that I'm doing, I found several that bits of plastic. Oh, I saw that one. Yeah, that's it. See the birds. And you're adding uh, some I drawings. Know, is that think. also? Yeah. Wow. In there. And I, I have some that are um, some that are. So you've already framed. Yeah. Oh, that's gorgeous. Now, do you have a, a plan for these post? Um, yeah, Sean is also asking, will these be sellable products? Yeah. And yeah. I was just going to say, do you have a plan for these post COVID that you would, would then have a show somewhere or do something yeah. with them? Yeah, I had some in a show. We'll see. Everything's been, been wrapped up. Um, so I <laughs> yeah, I've got, sorry. That's <laughs> Just, okay. <laughs> but there are some that I had in a, in a show earlier in the year, so that was oh, one. Wow. That so you've been doing these pieces for a while, but right now you're taking advantage of the time. Wow. Yeah, taking advantage of the time. Yeah, the yeah. Um, exactly, because normally they sit there in a pile, kind of um, waiting for something to happen to them. But I've also been working a lot with... Um, local plants so just sort of making paper uh -huh. that make different papers as production papers so these are um, seaweed ones for example I get grain from a local microbrewery and work with that I use railway tickets for the for the train line from here to London which is the Edinburgh London line um, so I do a train ticket paper which is really popular so it's a bit of a mixture between really commercial stuff yeah. um, and stuff that I want to be doing for myself. But I'm also trying to do a bit of 3D stuff. Um, again, working with mm. materials from the beach. And what I'm doing at the moment is, again, you, mostly working with Abaca, but dip, dipping... Um, the plastic pieces plastic and wooden and plant objects and with the plants this is a this is a seaweed root wow it strengthens them but it also gives you a surface that allows you to draw or write on it yeah um, so i've been doing a lot of these preparatory to adding text yeah. to them as well um, I haven't been doing so much on the actual books i, I make blank notebooks to sell in the shop um, but I really, and particularly once I've, I've got this little Adana up and running, um, mm -hmm. I have to put some new rollers on it. I want to be able to then go back to doing more, more, more bookie editions, books. More editions and artist yes. books. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the lady who was going to help me with that, unfortunately, we had, a, we had an appointment to do that just on the day where everything got locked down. So. Of course, as, so, as happens. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, still, still yeah. in the works. So yeah, I'm I'm kind of sitting here surrounded by a zillion and one unfinished things because that's how I work. Oh, I always have four or five things going on at once. I'm also I got approached by a small publisher um, a couple of months ago, and they have commissioned me to write a how-to paper making book, a basic one. Fantastic. Yeah. Not Helen Hebert style kind of, <laughs> but just a, a sort of accessible, colourful, 
book for book. that's fantastic that's kind of cool that's kind of cool yeah that's <laughs> awesome a, i'm working on that at the moment. you're working on that as well so you're yeah. you're keeping definitely excuse me definitely keeping busy are you doing any zoom teaching workshops or anything like that we're we've had lots of discussions about this um between um here in london the the place in sussex they wouldn't do online teaching it's just not that kind of a place it's very much being there is the experience you know sure, of course um but we're looking at the thing is with paper making I, i've said to my boss that the only real obstacle is the moles and decals because pretty much anything else you can adapt from household bits right. and pieces um, but it's very much a college, it's a public college, and it's, it needs to be accessible to folks who don't, aren't necessarily on a huge budget. Right. And of course, they come there and they use the equipment that we have. Right. And this would involve um, either purchasing a mold and decal or having the wherewithal to build one at home. Right, right. So we're trying to negotiate. I mean, I know people do teach paper making online. There's no reason why it shouldn't happen but it's just doing it in a way that is fair to everybody too exactly exactly you have to think equitable access and that's sort yeah. of thing. yeah absolutely yeah yeah okay so that's that's something that we're grappling with at the moment the view to to trying it in the autumn in the fall and seeing how it goes yeah do you have any news as far as when things like, are the schools opening up in the fall, or do you know yet? Oh, uh, it's just chaos here, Jamie. I mean, the, the, some of the elementary schools have actually opened this week for some of their classes. Okay. Because they seem to think that very young children don't get the virus, which, of course, is not true. But um, they're trying this out, I think... A lot of it, though, is motivated by economic reasons, which sure. is they want to get the parents back to work as well. So I think a lot of private schools, I think, have decided not to open until the fall. Um, but it's very yeah. incremental and yeah, and just I mean, we're all just taking the pandemic one day at a time for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of and things. For, for us here, we have had a spike in cases since the Memorial Day weekend because people mm -hmm. were having their parties and whatever. And so yep. there's been some evidence of spikes in cases across the United States. But I was just wondering how it was, how it was working there. And of course, you say you're opening sort of mm -hmm. <laughs> on the 15th. Like, are you, um, and you're going to open up by it? By only, are you doing any kind of online curbside pickup orders or anything like that? That are you thinking about that at all? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of my regular customers um, say, "Can I have ten sheets of this or whatever?" And then they will just come and pick Bye. it up. Yeah, the trouble yeah. is, it's so tempting because you haven't seen them for a while to have a great yeah. big <laughs> chat. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Seeing people in person is something that we we are all missing yeah absolutely so yes there has been a bit of that um i've also been posting stuff out to people i had a gentleman who who ordered quite a lot of paper who was supposed to be coming over for a trip from australia and picking the paper up while, while he was here and then of course he couldn't so i ended up mailing it to australia so you know, it's, it's really whatever works yeah um, whatever people. can happen luckily paper is is not something that's difficult to to okay. yeah yeah no. so i'm gonna i'm gonna trans transfer or like uh not translate move to a different line of questioning what mm -hmm. is your favorite fiber i would say it's probably at the moment uh equal running abaca and Koza. okay can you tell I us mean, why sure it, both in combination and separately. Separate. I think with the Abaca, because I really enjoy doing the sort of encapsulating um, and embedding stuff, I've got a couple of pieces here with very fine thread. 
in. That's probably oh, yeah. Favorite. Those Here's are lines of thread. Money. Yeah, the, yeah. Those threads that are, are in the, inside the, the abaco. Okay, that the, takes a lot of patience. It's, it does, but I find it quite kind of meditative. Sure. Um, and I really enjoy doing stuff like that. And then I do my, I think you had one of them on your, um, on your uh, collection of photos that you put up on Facebook or wherever it was. But I do, yeah, I do a lot of like the grids. Yeah. So um, it, how no, long are you beating the, popular. yeah, I love that one. How long are you beating the, um, okay, we have a question from the, from the chat. How are you laying the thread? Um, Just, Cass, I'm not sure if you know how the process of paper making I, I thought I, works, but I'm going to let, I'm going to let um, Lucy talk about that, but also how long are you beating the abaca? The abaca for this kind of stuff, I would beat it for six hours. Oh, good. She says, yes, I do. I'm a paper maker. Okay, gotcha. Oh, okay. So, so then, just I'm yeah. I'm cooching one thin sheet and I'm simply laying the threads on by hand and the moisture, the water in the sheet keeps them where they need to be. Keep them straight. And then I and then very cooch. carefully cooch another sheet onto the top. So it's in it's basically an encapsulation of the threads, yeah. just like the, the plastic. plastic um, but the thread is a little tiny bit more obsessive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and very very precise because you're the can you show that one that was diagonal with the threads very close together do you have a way of you're measuring those okay Kath thank you for clarifying I wasn't sure because I I'm sure you were I just do it by eye okay and you, can. you aren't measuring and what is the thread oh god no <laughs> it's just regular sewing thread um so cotton Poly cotton thread, I guess. I had I inherited a huge amount of sewing thread from my my late grandmother, and and I'm still working my way through that. But when you've put the threads on there, if you find that the distance isn't where you want it, if you're very careful, you can lift it up again. Yeah, and, and, and it won't cotton. damage the sheet at all. No, I mean abaca. Abaca, yeah, it's very it's strong. So how long are you beating that? That's six hours. That's six hours. Um, well, like, that's yeah. Those are beautiful. Um, and then how, when you're working with the Kozo, mm -hmm. are, you beating, are you beating that by hand, I assume? Or are you yeah. ordering it? From, okay. And then is this, because um, that looks very, 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 um, that's thin and very, very white. Yeah, that is, um, I mean, as long as you clean it, as long as you clean most of the bark out of it, even even stuff that hasn't been bleached will it will be very white. And what I at one point the only Kozo that I could get here was from a company who sold it in quite small quantities, and it had already been cooked, but not beaten, and it was very very white, and I think probably had been bleached. Um, whether by natural means or chemical, I do not know. But then I've I've now started getting. I will show you the space where I keep my fibers. Okay. Try and move very slowly so I don't make the computer crash. So you can probably hear the beater going back there. But this is sort of going back into the workspace. I'll come back to where I was. Sorry, there'll be a horrible noise now because I've got the beater running. Okay. I'd love to see the beater. You froze also. So um, we're just laying some of the definitions in on the, um, on the chat right now. So thank you, Rebecca, for adding definitions as well. Um, I am sad that... Okay. Lucy, are you there? You froze for a minute, Lucy. Okay. Oh, there you are. So just remember that you have to walk very slowly and move very slowly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's your so beater room. You see the fiber shelves in there. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I'll get away from it because it's too noisy. But um, here, here's something. Here's a blast from the past. Look. See if I can get that. You oh see that? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> That's really funny. Happy That's memories. Really funny. But yeah, so um, all that fiber in there, I'm trying to go slowly. All that fiber in there, I now get it from a place in um, Germany called Eiffelturmühle. The, co the Kozo or the Abaca or all of it? Kozo. Well, I had a lot of Abaca. If I, luckily, I managed to get some um, from somebody because it's really hard to get here. Yeah. But um, when I run out, yes, I will get it from them because one of the problems is here is, is getting specialist supplies. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have the equivalent of Carriage House or Twin Rocker. Right. Um, you know the paper making enterprise is over here and there are hand paper making um setups still a very few uh, but they tend to work just with more conventional cotton or linen rag sure. and make artist papers so if you're doing more unusual stuff um you tend to have to go abroad but a lot of the stuff they can't ship from the States to here because it counts as agricultural products. Oh. And that sets off all kinds of weird customs issues that cause problems. Okay. So I stocked up um, before Brexit because who knows what's going to happen there. Um, we're shipping stuff over even from Germany. So I, I stocked up and hopefully have enough Kozo. So do you, do you work with cotton or are you just exclusively Abaca and, and? No, 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 I work with everything. Um, and what is is your, yeah, you said that you do papers for stationery and that sort of thing. What yeah. do you usually make that out of for your production? I usually paper? make that out of a, around about two thirds cotton, one third Abaca mix. Um, okay. I also use, but sometimes just cotton, sometimes just cotton rag. I do, I do a bit of, of, of pure cotton rag, um, what, you know, paper for painting, people to do watercolors on, but there are other people in the UK who specialize in that. So I'm, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel, you know, of course. Um, and I love to also use flax, mm -hmm. although I hate beating it because it's a pain on the and you have to stand over it for two hours to stop it tying itself in knots. But I use that a lot for um, book covers. Yeah. And you know from cave paper how amazing it is. I don't think mine, mine is, is um, quite on that level, but I, I like using flax also for 3D stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you to Rebecca for, for putting those definitions and things in the chat for-, for Oh yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. It is not your job to, to check the chat. And I was trying to type as we were moving, but I was also losing my thread of the host duties. So thank you, Rebecca, for putting those in the chat. Um, I had some more questions for you. Um, sure. Do you have other artists that sell things in your shop? Um, I don't have artists, other artists that sell things in my shop all the time um, at the moment. I have a uh, guest artist sometimes. I have a friend who's a printmaker who actually used the shop to teach some classes in as well. And she uses my paper a lot. Um, and so sometimes she exhibits here. And then we also have an amazing local kind of cluster of illustrators. Oh. Um, and we have a literary festival here in the fall. And I last year had a sort of visiting the illustrators kind of open house in the shop as well and I definitely want to do more than that more of that kind of stuff and also in late summer knock on wood um, my son and his partner are going to come and live with us because my son's partner is going to be doing a master's in Edinburgh which is about 45 minutes from here on the train and he my son is a printmaker and a book artist yay <laughs> and in the family so and his partner is a photographer so i'm very much hoping that to work with them yeah. be able to, and expand sure. from there but i'm very clear that i don't like taking stuff on consignment i like to buy i just i just don't feel it's fair 
Okay. Except in very limited circumstances. I mean, if it's a, if it's a sort of a week or or whatever, and it, it's a guest artist, then that's fine. But if you're going to take stuff off people and keep it, yeah, I don't feel that it's fair to have artists work in the shop which they're not getting paid for. Right. And, just there on the off chance that it might sell. So I'd much rather buy stuff outright from people. Right. And, and I think it shows a belief in their product as well. It's not saying, well, yeah, you can put it in the shop, but if it doesn't sell sort of thing, which, mm -hmm. which make, makes, um, I think I just find it kind of ethically better, but at the same time, you know, there's a financial element to that. Of so course. I have to choose very carefully. Of course, and you want to support fellow artists, but you need to also, of course, yeah, keep in mind your own your own yes. support. Yes, and um, it's got. Sean, go ahead. It's got to be stuff that's compatible with the other stuff in the in the yeah. shop. Yeah, yeah. So Sean is asking, does your son have a website? Um, he. I'm not even sure if he's had a, if he has a website. Um, I'll, I can give you his his uh, Insta. Samuel Stokes, he's called. Um, so I'm not sure if he's actually got a website up and running. He may have stuff on the London Centre for Book Art site. Um, I'd have to check. Isn't that awful? I don't know if he's got a website. He could, he does a lot of collaborative stuff. And what um, is his friends. Instagram handle? So I can put that in the chats. I think it's Samuel Stokes. Let me check on my phone. I don't know. Okay. S T O K E S. I'm just going to drop that. S T O K E S. Yeah. Okay. Um, he doesn't post that often, but what he does put on there is um a very good representation of his work. It's quite. Let me just double check that I'm spelling it right. Samuel Dot Stokes. Oh, I did it wrong then. Okay, Samuel, Samuel Dot Stokes. Stokes. Okay, so people can find him on the Instagram. Yes. Dot Stokes. Okay, there we and go. And he, yeah, and he, um, he has another Instagram. He's also a climber. He's a climbing coach, as is his oh. partner. And so they have their other feed, which is them um, halfway up, up cliffs. Which is also on there if anyone wants to see it. As a mother, that's your own thing of, of um, yeah, freaking out. They're both, they are both quite obsessive about safety. So actually, you know, I'm, I'm quite reassured. Yeah, yeah. That, um, they will do the right thing. Of course. Of course. Of course. Um, so how did you come up for the, with the name of your press, your paper press? Tide Kettle. Well, I, I was kind of puzzling about it for a while. I think what I was looking for was something that was juxtaposing the, the wild and the domesticated. Okay. Um, so, you know, the tide here, the tides govern life fairly, very much. We're at the mouth of a river, quite a big river, mm -hmm. um, where everything is kind of regulated by the tides, and it's very much a feature of life. Also, this used to be an old bakery, oh. and we have the old ovens in the back in the yard, the old the old bread ovens in the yard. Oh my so God. I wanted to give kind of a nod to that, that comforting yeah, element. Of course. Of the see, sword. I always so, thought because I was. And then I Googled it to see yeah. if anyone else did it. Yeah, and you kept it. Because um, yeah. I was thinking it had something to do with tea and tides. So that's where I my brain went. Well, tea and tides. And of course. Of, of course. course. I actually don't like tea that much i know this is a sacrilegious <laughs> thing to say i don't i don't drink as much tea or i like herbal tea and stuff but black tea doesn't agree with me Not so, much. so I, i'm a disgrace to my my nation i'm afraid i don't drink <laughs> I don't. thank you for clarifying the definition <laughs> of the of the of the the title of your shop and your paper press i appreciate that and also the picture of you on the rocks with the water. That's where you <clears throat> usually go for your walks and find all this plastic? That was actually, no, that was actually on the west coast of Scotland. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. 
looking across to the Isle of Mull. That was on a, on a couple of days. We, we went over there a couple of years ago. Of course, we can't go anywhere now. Sure. But um, no, so that's on the opposite side of the country. Equally beautiful, but, but very different. If, if you look at my Instagram, I don't want to be plugging this all the time, but there's loads of pictures of the coast where I am here. On, on my Instagram, so. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking with us. I appreciate your being our quarantor today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I feel very honored to have been invited back. Back, back, back. to Evanston slash Chicago. Back to the old country. <laughs> Vir virtual, virtually, anyway. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. If you want to support more of this programming from Artists Bookhouse, you can always go to our website, artistspluralbookhouse.org slash donate. And all of our past Corn Tours are on there as well as on our YouTube page if you want to watch, if you've missed any over the, over the past, oh gosh, eight weeks, I guess. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you for coming to this week's Quarant Tour with Lucy Baxendahl, brought to you by Artist Bookhouse. If you would like to support more of this programming, please consider a donation at artistbookhouse.org slash donate. Next week, we will be talking with Kevin Kelly, a New York Public Library librarian and programmer. We'll talk books, we'll talk libraries in the time of COVID, and we will talk pride. Thank you so much.